Hey guys, Miss Hill here, and we are going to continue our lectures talking about individual module six. And this module deals specifically with newborn care, prematurity, thermoregulation of the newborn, and congenital heart defects in the concept of perfusion, specifically ventral septal defects. Here are your learning outcomes. And we're going to start talking specifically about initial care of the newborn. One thing I would like to mention before we get started is that you need to study your Ballard scoring tool, your APGAR assessment, and your newborn reflexes for this particular module. All right, so where do we start when we talk about initial care of the newborn? Um, you got to remember your ABCs. And so with newborns, one thing that's extremely important is that we have to make, make sure that um, we make sure that they have a very clear airway as much as possible. Um, we need to position them supine with their head down or to the side. We want to make sure we wipe their mouth and face after birth, suction with a bulb syringe, um, D. Lee wall suction unit, and that's what we use whenever we deep suction an infant. It's a catheter that can be passed either nasopharyngeally or oropharyngeally and um, it's connected to the wall suction unit and it has a little trap on it um, and the brand name is just called a D. Lee. Um, we always suction the mouth first and then the nose so we can remember that by um, your alphabet. M comes before N so we suction the mouth and then the nose. We may have to give newborns some blow by oxygen and what that means is that we just hold the oxygen tubing um, at a low flow and allow that to pass um, by their face. We can cup our hand over their uh, mouth and nose and just kind of hold the tubing, uh, the oxygen tubing there and um, on a high flow, I'm sorry. Allow that to um, pass by their face and just give them a little bit of extra oxygen boost. Um, one thing that we don't want to do is over oxygenate newborns. Um, we need to assess for nasal flaring and cyanosis and then assess for that lusty cry um, and also note that newborns may sneeze. So um, Clearing the airway is very important in the newborn. We have to remember that they've been in utero and their lungs are full of amniotic fluid. Um, if they've had a vaginal delivery, partially we have hopefully squeezed some of that amniotic fluid out um, of their lungs through the birth process, but that's not always the case. So um, especially with C-section babies, they tend to be a little more junky or wet whenever we auscultate them, um, their airways are not quite as clear. Um, nasal flaring and cyanosis um, are both signs of respiratory distress in the newborn. Um, nasal flaring is whenever their nostrils flare out as they breathe. Um, we have to remember also that acrocyanosis, so blue tinge to the hands and the feet, are normal in a newborn. But if you see cyanosis in the trunk, um, in the face, um, in the extremities, um, circumoral cyanosis, none of those things are normal in the newborn. It means that they are struggling to breathe just as, um, or struggling to oxygenate just as it would be for a adult. Um, in terms of sneezing, why do we all sneeze? We all sneeze um, because we have something in our airway or something in our nasal passages that we need to 
get out. And so newborns may sneeze to help clear their airway. This is normal. It does not mean that they have a cold or that there's anything wrong with them. So we can assure their families that it's perfectly normal for them to do some sneezing. However, excessive sneezing in a newborn can indicate that they're going through some type of withdrawal. Um, so maybe uh, mom was a substance abuser. If newborn is excessively sneezing, they may be withdrawing from a substance that the mother was on. The next thing that we have to do is we have to promote thermoregulation in the newborn. And the easiest way for us as nurses to promote thermoregulation is to place the infant skin to skin with mom. Um, Research has shown that this is the best way to keep their blood sugars stable. This is the best way to keep their temperature stable. This is the best way to keep their vital signs stable. It's the best way to allow them to bond mom. Um, it's just um, round and round the the absolute best thing that we can do for them. Um, in terms of simplistic care after birth. Um, we have to assess the vital signs of a newborn every 30 minutes for a two hour time period after they are born. Um, and the vital signs that we assess for these newborns are temperature, obviously. Um, we assess their heart rate and we assess their respiration. are born because if they are wet, then they lose heat um, through their bodies. We also want to cover their head um, because they lose a lot of heat from their head as well. We want to postpone their bath until their temperature is at least 97 degrees Fahrenheit or greater. And if skin to skin is not possible with a um, family member, we want to make sure that we dress the infant, keep the the baby dry and warm, and place them under a radiant warmer until their temperature is stable enough that they can um, be in a bassinet on their own. We want to protect all newborns from hospital acquired infections. Good hand washing at all times by everyone is imperative and this is something that we need to teach to the family members, to mom, to dad, um, grandmothers, all visitors entering and exiting the baby's room. We want to make sure that all of the personal care items for a newborn are dedicated to only that newborn. So combs, um, bulb syringes, diapers, if mom is formula feeding, wipes, everything needs to be individualized um, to that newborn. We don't need to be sharing from newborn to newborn. We want to make sure that we maintain strict surgical aseptic technique during different types of procedures. So if the baby is having a circumcision, having digits, extra digits removed, um, if we are doing any other kinds of surgical procedures. We want to make sure that we maintain really good surgical aseptic technique to prevent uh, introduction of infection to the newborn. We want to assess maternal, prenatal, and labor and delivery histories because uh, if moms had an infection intrapartally or if mom had an infection antepartally, then it's very possible um, that those infections can carry over into the fetus or into the newborn baby. So we have to be um, very certain about what mom's history was. Um, a good example here would be if mom is group beta strep positive and she came in and precipitously delivered and was unable to get any type of prophylactic antibiotics for her GBS status. 
um, that newborn would need to be watched very closely for signs and symptoms of group beta strep sepsis. We put erythromycin ophthalmic ointment to the lower conjunctival sac for all newborns who are born. Um, this prevents any type of um, eye infection in the newborn, specifically to prevent um, things such as chlamydia and gonorrhea because they are in such high um, incidences in moms these days, we just give this to everybody. Plus, um, if, you know, that being vaginally delivered, those babies are not really particularly coming through a very clean passageway. So we want to make sure that we prevent any types of eye infections. Umbilical cord care is also very important. This is a portal of infection. Um, we have an, uh, two arteries and a vein that are on the umbilical cord, and both of those obviously go into the newborn umbilicus. And also, it is stop, and it will eventually fall off. It still is a place that is moist. Um, it's a place that is close to the genitalia, so close to dirty diapers, um, and just a, a really good place for bacteria to sort of breed and grow. So we want to make sure that we do umbilical cord stump care really more frequently than daily. Um, we want to do it um, every day, but also as needed with diaper changes um, or other types of um, – sorry, guys, I'm losing my train of thought here – we want to do it daily, but we also want to do it as needed. So PRN with diaper changes or um, any other types of things that happen to the baby um, that could introduce any types of infection in that area or types of bacteria. Um, used to, we put something called triple dye on the umbilical cords. Um, and then we moved from triple dye to alcohol. Um, and now we don't really put anything on the cord, just warm soapy water is fine to clean it with. Um, we just want to make sure that it stays clean and dry and that we teach moms and dads to do things like make sure that they turn the diaper down so don't cover the cord with the diaper whenever you're diapering your infant. Um, let them know what signs of uh, infection are, so any kind of pussy drainage or a foul smell, all of those things need to be reported. If the baby needs any type of antibiotics, then um, as nursing personnel, we obviously would administer those as they are prescribed by the pediatrician. But we also need to remember that with um, children, specifically neonates, we have to be very sure about what types of drugs that we're giving, and we have to be sure about the amount of drugs that we are giving. So safe dose is always imperative whenever you're giving medications to a neonate. You always need to be calculating safe dose. Um, and also weight, an accurate weight is imperative whenever we're giving medications um, to children, especially those who are very small, like the neonate. Um, back to umbilical cord care really quickly, we don't want to um, submerge the umbilical cord in water um, until it falls off. So this is an important teaching thing that we need to talk with parents about. Um, they should not be submerging their baby in water to give them a bath until that cord falls off. We want to make sure that we have them keep it clean and dry. and just let them know that there's no need to put any kind of ointment on the umbilical cord these days. It actually will fall off much quicker if they just clean it with regular soap and water. Promotion of safety for the newborn is something that is taken very seriously these days. And 
one way that we do that for the newborn is to apply an identification and an alarm band to the baby. So as soon as the baby's born, it is given identification bands that match the mother's band. Usually dad is given one too if there is a significant other present. Um, but always mom and baby are given matching bands prior to the baby ever leaving mom's side from uh, out of the delivery room. Alarm bands are used um, to prevent infant abductions from the hospital. We take photographs and do feet print. We administer vitamin K to help with blood clotting, and this is done in the vastus lateralis. The reason we do it here is because that's the only muscle in a neonate that is really big enough to introduce any type of intramuscular medication. We don't want to give those medications in um, the ventrogluteal muscle at this age because they're not developed because these babies aren't walking yet. We check the umbilical cord for bleeding um, and make sure that it's clamped well, that it has no signs and symptoms of infection. We control visitors who are infected. If they're visitors who have to visit, um, then they need to be wearing a mask when they come in. Um, but preferably, we like them to not visit at all. For little boys who've had circumcisions, we want to watch for um, post-circumcision bleeding. Um, there will be a little bit of bleeding after circumcision, but um, a lot of bleeding is not um, a lot of bleeding is not supposed to happen after a circumcision, so we need to make sure that we educate parents. A small little spot of blood in the diaper is okay. Um, but anything really more than that should be reported and taken a close look at because it may be something that needs to have, you know, have pressure held to it or it may be something that the physician needs to look at. Um, another thing that we look for in terms of safety in the newborn is looking for a bonding and attachment behaviors between the parents and the baby. Um, it's very important that we know that mom is bonding with her baby. We have a very short stay in the hospital whenever um, a mom delivers her baby, 24 hours before discharge after a vaginal delivery and 48 for a C-section. So ensuring that bonding has happened um, is very important because we don't want to send these parents home if we're sending the baby home to parents who have um, not bonded with it well, um, don't know how to take care of it, and I'm sorry guys, I'm hearing my baby cry. I was hoping maybe he would be quiet so that I could finish this lecture. I think I might have to take a little pause here. All right, be back with you in just a minute. All right, so something else that we also have to encourage as nurses in regards to initial care of the newborn is promoting parent and infant attachment. This is very important. Um, we want to make sure that parents have the opportunity and we want to encourage them to hold and touch um, their baby, to talk to their baby if the infant is stable. We want to reinforce positive physical features of the baby. Um, encourage breastfeeding as soon as possible. We want to have the parents start infant care as soon as possible. So feeding, diapering, consoling, comforting, holding, all of these things um, have to do with infant care. And we want to make sure that the parents know how to do that prior to leaving the hospital. The sooner they get started, 
the better foundation they'll have when they go home, especially if they're new parents. Um, one reason why we encourage breastfeeding as soon as possible is because newborns have um, periods of reactivity. And the earliest periods of reactivity is that first hour after birth. They're super alert. Their eyes are open. They're looking around. They're paying attention to their environment. And so this is a prime time to initiate breastfeeding, and it also helps breastfeeding to be even more successful um, if we can go ahead and initiate it during this first period of reactivity, which is that first hour. We have to educate new parents. Um, hand washing is really imperative, and we want to talk about that with um, all of our patients, but specifically for patients who are taking um, home a brand new baby. We want to show them how to hold the infant and how to dress the infant, talk to them about suctioning with the bulb syringe, how to take their temperature. Um, we do this axillary. Um, some hospitals have a policy where they want you to do it rectally. Um, so it just depends on the hospital's policy. But for a parent, they need to know how to do both. They need to know how to take a rectal temp, and they need to know how to do an axillary one. We want to teach them how to bathe the baby and how to care for their skin, um, what things to look for in terms of jaundice, how to feed with the bottle or the breast or both. We want to talk with them about umbilical cord care, circumcision care, or um, care for that baby who may be uncircumcised. We have to talk with them about car seat safety, signs of illness. They have to have um, different numbers to call. We want to make sure um, that they have all of the information that they need in regards to SIDS prevention. And whenever you listen to the next module, I am seven, um, that one talks about oxygenation and SIDS specifically. So a um, couple of things is that we want to always lay them on their backs to sleep, never on their stomachs, never on their sides, no extra blankets, pillows, stuffed animals, um, no extra clothing, nothing like that in the crib. And if possible, infant CPR is a really good tool for parents to have in their tool belt. A few nursing diagnoses to consider for the normal newborn, ineffective airway clearance related to mucus and retained lung fluid, effective, ineffective thermoregulation related to physiological heat losses um, and mechanisms, health-seeking behaviors related to first-time parents and lack of knowledge of basic infant care, risk for infection related to immature immune system, and risk for injury related to age and immaturity of the body system. And I'm sure that you can think of several more nursing diagnoses that we could use for the normal newborn, but those are just a few. So what do we expect in terms of outcomes? Well, obviously we want to start with our ABCs. We want the infant to not have any signs or symptoms of respiratory distress. We want their temperature to stay Stable. We want it at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit within the first two hours after birth. We want their heart rate to be at least um, 110 and their respirations to be at around 40. Um, the normal vital signs that we're using for newborns is heart rate of 110 to 160 and um, respirations of 30 to 60. So you can see here, heart rate 120, respirations 40, kind of fall within that range. We want the parents to demonstrate basic infant care techniques. We want them to be confident about those care techniques. And we want them to display attachment behaviors, appropriate bonding. We want the infant to not suffer any type of physical injury or develop complications while in our care or when they go home.
So again, one thing that I want you guys to make sure that you um, study is your APGAR scoring system, the Ballard assessment tool, and newborn reflexes. Um, and this video is a video that has to do with newborn examination and check after birth. And I'm going to allow you to watch that on your own. I'm not going to play it during the lecture for time's sake. So we're going to start talking about different types of body system changes in regards to the newborn and how we change in terms of from a fetal system to a external human system. The first one that we're going to talk about is the respiratory system. So obviously with um, the fetus we get our respiratory exchange through the placenta and the umbilical cord and then once born the babies have to transition from that type of respiratory exchange to doing respiratory exchange on their own through the nose and the mouth and the lungs. So to be successful with respiratory system changes from fetal respiratory system to um, an external neonate respiratory system, two things have to happen. We have to have number one, lung expansion which will allow pulmonary ventilation to happen. And we also have to have, number two, an increase in pulmonary circulation. Now, that should make sense to you because we cannot breathe unless our lungs expand. And we cannot oxygenate unless our pulmonary system gets some type of circulation running through it. Now remember in utero the newborn does all of that really through the placenta. The pulmonary system gets a little bit of circulation when the baby is in utero but not it's not adequate enough um, to maintain oxygenation after delivery. That pulmonary circulation has to increase so that our um, red blood cells can exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide and if that circulation doesn't happen then our body can't exchange that um, carbon dioxide and oxygen can't be delivered to the rest of the body. Um, lung expansion also has to happen for pulmonary ventilation to occur. So if the babies cannot expand their lungs after they are born then the respiratory system is not going to work like it should. A few things listed here that happen at birth is inspiration and expiration begins with the first cry. Lung fluid is reabsorbed and not totally but the majority of lung fluid is reabsorbed on that first cry. The alveoli must expand in the presence of surfactant. So surfactant is that phospholipid that we have talked about earlier antipartally that babies have um, after they reach a certain point of gestation in their lungs and that helps to keep their alveoli open. If we don't have surfactant in the lungs, the alveoli will collapse and then oxygen and carbon dioxide cannot exchange appropriately. And then we have to have a functional residual capacity um, for an adequate respiratory exchange to occur. A functional residual capacity is the oxygen or the, it's the air that's left in the lungs after you exhale. So if everybody could take a deep breath and then let out your air, and now let out some more air. So even after you have an exhalation, you still have a functional residual capacity left in your lungs. You still have that little bit of extra air in there. Um, if we didn't, if we blew 
all of the air that we had out of our lungs every time we exhaled, our alveoli and our lungs would basically just collapse. There has to be something left to keep them open. So um, after that, we've got to have some pulmonary vascular resistance, and that has to decrease so that pulmonary blood flow to the lungs can increase. So if you think of vascular resistance, don't, um, you know, you don't even have to give it into pulmonary that confuses you. Just think of vascular resistance. Um, if something is resistant, it's harder to accomplish, correct? So if pulmonary vascular resistance is extreme, then the blood flow to that area is going to be very complicated or it will not happen adequately. So we have to decrease the vascular resistance in the pulmonary system in order for the blood flow to the lungs to increase. If we can increase blood flow to the lungs of the neonate, then we can oxygenate appropriately and exchange carbon dioxide well. So that is the number two in terms of the things we have to have successfully um, met in order for respiratory system changes to happen. That's that increase in pulmonary circulation. There are a few types of um, things that might affect pulmonary vascular resistance in terms of newborns, and some of those things might um, impede a decrease in that pulmonary vascular resistance are small for gestational age infants because they have an immature musculature and that and because of that they have an inadequate chest wall compression and expansion so they have difficulty um, in terms of that chest wall expanding and contracting because of that immature musculature and that affects the way they're able to decrease their pulmonary vascular resistance. Um, for C-section babies, they have an absence of that chest wall compression. For um, also moms who um, may be substance abusers or have used drugs um, even ones that maybe we have given them for pain control, that can cause respiratory depression in the infant. If we cause respiratory depression, then we can't very well decrease pulmonary vascular resistance. And then also, aspiration is another thing that can affect pulmonary vascular resistance. Um, so babies who have meconium, so what is the clinical significance of chest wall compression during delivery? And we've talked about this several times, um, that it helps to increase the intrathoracic pressure in the newborn, which helps with fluid reabsorption. So it causes a pressure change in the thoracic cavity that allows fluid to be reabsorbed into the lungs. That way, when the babies are born, they're not quite as junky. It helps squeeze some of that lung fluid out. So for C-section babies, um, that squeeze doesn't happen and they may have more fluid present and need a little more um, respiratory help um, because of that. Just something that we have to remember as nurses. So what about our characteristics of newborn respiration? Um, we know that normal is 30 to 60 breaths per minute. They tend to be shallow breathers and their rhythm is irregular. Um, newborns have periods of apnea that are normal, um, anywhere from five to 15 seconds. And that's okay. So we call that periodic breathing. Um, their diaphragmatic should be, or their diaphragm should be in sync um, with their um, their abdomen and their chest should move at the same time. I'm not even sure what I, 
I need to rephrase that on this PowerPoint. Um, these babies are also obligatory nose breathers. All babies are obligatory nose breathers. So we have to make sure that their nasal passages are nice and clear um, because if we don't, um, they are not going to do very well if their nasal passages are blocked in any way, either from congenital anomalies or from mucus plugs or from fluid that's stuck in there. Um, so we want to make sure that their nasal passages are nice and clear so that we don't have any types of respiratory distress begin to develop. As a nurse, when you're assessing the respiratory system of a newborn, there are a few things that we look for that spell out trouble. And um, those are retractions, which mean um, intracostal retractions. So if you're looking at the baby's chest and you start to see intracostal retractions, um, that is not a good sign. If you start to see nasal flaring or grunting in the newborn, um, those are all three signs of respiratory danger, um, meaning that the baby is struggling to oxygenate um, and struggling to keep their respiratory system afloat. And they're going to need an intervention quickly. All right, so let's talk about the cardiovascular system for a minute. We have to from build circulation into normal circulation after birth. So we know that with fetal circulation, things happen a little differently. We have some um, different shunting that happens in the fetal circulatory system. So we have the ductus arteriosus up here. We have the foramen ovale down here, and then we have the ductus venosus here. And all of these things have to shut themselves off after birth for our circulatory system to begin shunting blood into the pulmonary system to oxygenate the lungs. So we have to move from fetal to neonatal circulation, and that includes the closure of those three shunts the ductus venosus, the foramen ovale, and the ductus arteriosus. Um, we have to decrease pulmonary resistance, and we do that as a result of increased oxygen in the lungs. Um, so as those shunts close, then pulmonary resistance will decrease, and we can start to oxygenate those lungs. We also have increased systemic vascular resistance, and this is a result of cutting the umbilical cord. Transient physiologic heart murmurs also may be heard whenever you do your assessment on a newborn, and um, that just means that you may hear a heart murmur one time, and then when you go back and listen again, you might not hear it. And that has to do with the closing of those shunts, specifically the foramen ovale. And um, so it's important for you to know what causes heart murmurs and why you hear those. And the reason is because of turbulent blood flow. So if there's an incomplete closure of the ductus arteriosus or the foramen ovale, then you may hear those transient heart murmurs. 90% um, of the ones that you will hear in a newborn are transient, um, and normally they will take care of themselves. So we want to make sure that capillary refill is less than three seconds because we want to make sure we've got good circulation. A heart rate somewhere between 100 and 160 is normal in a newborn. Um, and acrocyanosis is okay, so hands and feet are blue. Um, that's okay in a newborn. Blood pressure varies for age and weight, and uh, blood volume is somewhere around 85 milliliters per kilogram. 
their red, red blood cells are 5.1 to 5.3 million per milliliter. And one thing to note about red blood cells in newborns is that they have a lifespan of 80 to 100 days in infants. Um, that's about three quarters of the lifespan of what they are for adults, I believe. And so they don't make red blood cells as quickly as adults do. Um, so they can have quicker problems with anemia. Um, they also don't break down red blood cells as readily as adults do, so they're at risk for jaundice as well. Um, white blood cells also can be elevated after birth, especially neutrophils. And the reason for this is because of the stress of the birthing process. So just like we find maternal white blood cells to be elevated after labor and delivery, we also find this in the newborns as well. We have several different types of laboratory test results that we can get from blood sampling through a heel stick on a newborn. Um, we can check glucose. We can do PKU testing. Um, we can check for, um, we can do CBCs. We can do all kinds of laboratory testing through heel sticks. Mainly um, what we do is glucose and PKU testing. So we can also assess um, jaundice levels and that kind of thing as well. The gastrointestinal system of the newborn is much different than the adult. Um, their gastrointestinal system can hold anywhere from 50 to 60 milliliters. It has a less acidic pH than grown-ups. Um, peristalsis should begin to happen in about one hour after birth. So as um, that applies to your nursing assessment, you should be able to hear bowel sounds in a newborn at least within the first hour after being born. Air also enters the stomach. Um, it enters the stomach much more easily than it do does in an adult, um, partly because the cardiac sphincter is immature. Um, babies also um, do not have pancreatic amylase, and this is an enzyme that's needed to digest starches. So this is why we don't give newborns solid foods. So no rice cereal, no oatmeal, um, because those things are starches, and babies do not have pancreatic amylase to be able to break those down. Um, Moving backwards, back to the cardiac sphincter, with that sphincter being immature, it causes regurgitation of newborn feedings. So we have to make sure that we avoid overfeeding babies, and we have to make sure that we burp them well because they can't do that for themselves. Their salivary glands are immature, so they do not make saliva very readily. Lipase is minimal, so they cannot digest fat. We should see their meconium pass within a 24-hour period, and if we don't, that is um, a warning sign for us to look for other types of illnesses. That meconium is that very dark, sticky, black, um, blackish-greenish stool that um, babies pass, and the reason it is that color is because it is basically amniotic fluid um, that's passing through. For moms who are bottle feeding, we want to make sure that they have the correct techniques to be able to, to bottle feed appropriately. Um, they need to be burping often, so about every 10 to 15 milliliters of feeding, they should be burping their infants. We need to teach them not to reuse formula to keep the infant upright while feeding and to keep the nipple full of formula. We don't want half air in the nipple and half formula in the nipple because they already have air um, readily entering the stomach. Um, they already cannot burp on their own. And we want to make sure that we keep as much air out of their system as we possibly can. So what about for breastfed babies? How do we know when breastfed babies are satisfied? Um, well, they will 
exhibit anywhere from six to eight wet diapers a day. That's your telltale sign that they're getting plenty um, to drink. Um, they will exhibit less um, feeding behaviors. So, for example, they will not root as often. Um, they will not suck on their hands as often. Their feeding behaviors will begin um, to lessen. And you will also hear less crying. If they're satisfied, they won't be crying. Prior to us talking about the urinary system, I want to mention the hepatic system really quickly. Um, we already know that in terms of the hepatic system, one thing that we are very cautious of in newborns is jaundice. Um, so the nursery word for jaundice is hyperbilirubinemia. And this happens when the babies um, are attempting to break down red blood cells and we have a buildup of bilirubin in the system. Um, it can happen because of polycythemia, so too many red blood cells. It can happen because of RH incompatibility between mom and baby. And it also can happen because of um, hematomas that maybe the baby developed in delivery. So, um, you know, if we used a kiwi um, to help with the delivery process um, and that formed a hematoma on the head, um, and the body tries to start breaking that down, the baby can get jaundice from that. One way we correct jaundice is through phototherapy. And that's where we place babies under those UV lights. We can place them under an overhead light. Um, we can place them on a billy blanket, um, which is just like a UV light pad. And then we can swaddle them up um, with that blanket on their skin. But in terms of some nursing interventions that are really important in regards to phototherapy, we want to always make sure that the babies are placed under the lights because that's the way that we can rid the body of that bilirubin. And we don't want that bilirubin to get too high in the neonatal system because it can cause brain damage. We always want to make sure that their eyes and their genitals are covered from that ultraviolet light. We want to reposition them every couple of hours, and we want to assess them for signs and symptoms of dehydration because they're lying under a light for periods at a time, um, long periods of time, and that will dehydrate them. So we want to make sure that we assess for signs and symptoms of dehydration in the newborn whenever we've got one that's on phototherapy. With the urinary system, we always check for a void after birth, and uh, sometimes it is straw, or most of the time it's straw colored and odorless, and that's from the amniotic fluid. Um, they need to void within 24 hours after birth. If they do not have um, a void within 24 hours after birth, we start worrying about other issues. Babies are unable to concentrate urine until they're about three months old, which makes them high, um, at high risk for dehydration. If they can't concentrate their urine, that means they can't pull fluid back into their circulatory system to keep themselves hydrated. They just pee everything out. Um, their glomerular filtration rate is also low, which means they're unable to dispose of water rapidly. Um, and that requires us as nurses to be very careful about how we administer fluids to neonates as well. Um, at two days old, um, They have about 15 milliliters per gram, um, or about two to six times that. And they have a high specific gravity, 
We may see brick red or pink stains in the diaper, and we want to warn moms and dads about that and educate them on that. Um, it has to do with hormones from the mom. Um, so it's a pseudo-menstruation almost um, for the female. It's a, basically a hormone withdrawal. So the babies have this, these, all these hormones circulating in their system that mom had in hers. And once they're born, those hormones begin to withdraw, and then we may see um, a little bit of red or pink stains in the diaper. And the term for that is pseudo-menstruation. Six to eight wet diapers a day is our best indicator that the newborn is adequately nourished and hydrated. If we're seeing less than six wet diapers a day, that's when we want to start to worry that maybe they're not being um, fed enough or that they are becoming dehydrated for whatever reason it may be, infection, um, whatever. And that's what we also want to teach parents. With the immune system, newborns have limitations in their inflammatory responses, which make infections really harder to recognize in this population. So as adults, whenever we have an infection, our first indicator is hyperthermia. We have an increased temperature or a fever. That's usually our first sign. However, for a newborn, hypothermia is a better predictor of infection instead of a fever. So they will actually drop their temperature prior to spiking a fever um, when they come down with an infection. So that's really important to know as a nurse because if you cannot maintain your baby's temperature at a certain level, you know, you it's been 96 98.6 degrees as you've checked it, and then you go back an hour later um, after the baby has had a stable temperature, you go back an hour later, a couple of hours later, and the baby keeps dropping their temperature down to 90, 97, 96. It could be an indication that that baby has an infection. IgG is transferred transplacentally. Um, so this is your immunoglobulin, and it's transferred in the third trimester. So that's important to note because if the baby does not make it to the third trimester, meaning the baby is preterm, then they're going to be more prone to infections. So less than 34 weeks, um, much more prone to infections because they do not get that IgG third trimester transfer. Um, and that is a passive immunity that is very good for the newborns because it helps protect them against um, all types of illnesses once they're born. And even though it's a passive immunity, it does last for a little while. So we have passive immunity that's acquired from mom. And then for those babies who are breastfed, they also get passive immunity as well. Um, this is one reason why colostrum is so good for babies because it has an increased concentration of these antibodies that are really good for the baby to pass on that immunity from mom to baby. IgM is actively produced by the fetus, and this happens beginning somewhere between 10 and 15 weeks gestation. Um, so as the baby is uh, born, they continue to actively produce these Ig this IgM. Um, But it takes time for that to build up in the baby's system. So it's very important that they get this passive immunity from their mom. Immunity disappears in around eight weeks. So that passive immunity that's received from mom 
is gone by about eight weeks. So that's when we start immunizing our babies, or that's when we should start immunizing um, our babies. Active immunity after the hep B injection is acquired because we give that hep B injection after birth. And remember, if we're giving a vaccine, then we are causing the body to actively make antibodies against whatever we're introducing, whatever antigen we're introducing. So that's an active immune response from the newborn. The inflammatory response is also very limited in newborns. So if they are introduced to an infection or they are introduced to a bacteria or a virus or whatever it is, their inflammatory response is very immature. So it's not able to react as quickly or as efficiently as a grown-up would. Um, their hypothalamic response to pyrogenesis is also um, very poor, meaning that they cannot uh, spike a fever like an adult would. So that's one reason why we don't see that spike to start with. Um, we see hypothermia instead. Make sure that you study your newborn reflexes. Those are very important. And uh, I'm going to allow you to study those on your own. The neurological system in a newborn is obviously immature. Um, they have an immature brain. Um, but they do have reactivity to sensory stimulation. They're very good at smells. Um, they can see. They might not be able to see far away, but they can see up close. Um, one reason why we want to encourage moms to hold babies in face or very close up is because they can see about 8 to 12 inches when they're first born, but that's as far as they can see clearly. Um, so that's one reason why we encourage moms to hold babies up close. Um, but they are very reactive to sensory stimulation. Another reason why skin-to-skin -skin contact is a very important right after birth. Um, oh, I'm sorry, guys. I've got the yawns. Uh, another reason... Um, Another thing about this sensory stimulation in newborns is that it is very influenced by what happens um, by their in utero experiences. So, for example, they can hear their mom's voice when they're in utero. So, it's important that pregnant moms talk to their newborns, um, talk to their um, babies while they're still inside because babies can recognize their mom's voice and then once they're born um, that sensory stimulation of her voice makes them feel soothed and um, you know less scared and it will help calm them down. Babies should be able to move all four extremities and the way that they communicate with us is through crying. Um, and it takes a while for moms to recognize what different cries mean um, for her newborn, especially if she's a first-time mom, and it's okay for us to teach her that. Um, hypertonic muscle tone is normal in newborns. So this is your um, flexed-up newborn. They are very resistant to extension. So if you try to pull their elbow out or extend their elbow, it's very hard to do that. Um, that's a normal neurological response. And in terms of their level of consciousness, we know that newborns have periods of reactivity. They have an alertness, and then they have a quiet sleep state. Um,
that reactivity period happens the first 30 to 60 minutes after birth. That's called the first period of reactivity. And then they will have a quiet alert state. And we want to encourage bonding and breastfeeding during this time. It's really important to do that because the babies are nice and alert during that first period of reactivity. And they will do better in terms of bonding with mom, latching on, um, and doing those those types of things in the first hour. And they'll be more successful at them as well. All right, we're going to um, stop there for individual module six. And this is PowerPoint 1, Lecture 1. And we will continue back talking about newborn complications and high-risk newborns. Thanks for listening.